So today we're doing Churchland's um, eliminative materialism with the propositional attitudes. And on um, Thursday we'll be doing Dennett's True Believers, The Intentional Strategy and Why It Works. Um, Dennett's paper is a very brilliant paper. Dennett is a very variable performer, it seems to me. But de this paper is him absolutely at the top of his game. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous paper. Um, Churchland's theory about the mind is very simple and very radical. The theory is um, there is no such thing. Um, the problems we've been discussing all term are in general fake problems um, because the mind simply does not exist. Um, now, I think when you first encounter that idea, it seems that, well, this has got to be wrong. Right? No, no, nobody says, well, that's what I've always thought. The mind doesn't exist. Um, I'm not conscious. I don't think. I mean, Descartes, when Descartes said that the first and most immediate certainty is uh, that I think, then I guess all of us in the class take it for granted. That kind of makes sense. That's a good starting point. The physical world might not exist. That is kind of uncertain. But whether I exist, whether there is thinking going on, that is certain. But Churchland's um, move is to turn that right round the other way. So the first thing to do is to see how Churchland's um, idea is even intelligible. How could that possibly be right? So I want to spend a little time um, talking about the idea that our ordinary thinking about the mind is a theory. Talking about the mind is a theory in the way that talking about the physics of the objects around you or the behavior of electrical circuits, that involves theory. If folks, th this is really the decisive move in what Churchland is saying. If folk psychology is a theory about the causes of behavior, if when you're talking about what you think and what you feel and what you believe, you are working with a hypothesis about the causes of your behavior, then that's something that, in principle, could be completely wrong. So if Churchland can be persuasive about this, then um, he's really halfway there. This is really the decisive move to stop it seeming just unintelligible that the mind might not exist, to having it seem like a reasonable hypothesis where it might go one way and it might go the other. So look, here's a puzzle. Here's a puzzle. Here is Maxi. Here we have Maxi on the left. Maxi? OK. Now, as you can see, Maxi has a ball. Yes? OK. Now, what Ma what's going to happen is Maxi puts his ball in the red box. Follow me like a leopard. OK? You're, you're completely with me so far? OK. Now Maxi leaves the scene having put his ball in the red box. And now, Maxie's dad, who, as you can see, is a somewhat furtive and um, suspicious-looking figure, <laughs> um, comes onto the scene. And Maxie's dad moves the ball from the red box to the blue box. So Maxie doesn't see his dad move the ball. Maxie doesn't know that the um, ball is in the blue box now. OK, following me like a leopard. So here is the crux. The big moment is when Maxi returns. Maxi wants his ball. Where will Maxi look first? Put, OK, put your hand up if you think the answer is the red box. Very good. Put your hand up if you think the answer is the blue box. Wow, OK, very good. The right answer is the red box. Um, now, so congratulations. Um, uh, but the thing is, for each of you in this class, there was a time when you could not do that, um, when that problem would have been impossible for you. Um, this, is, th th this kind of scenario has been shown to children between two and five years old thousands and thousands of times since the early 90s. And um, actually, some of the basic work on it having been done 
right here in Berkeley in Alison Gopnik's lab. And the basic finding was children at three years old will say the blue box. Maxi will look in the blue box. They don't have the idea that Max is going to look in the red box. It's a very robust, it's a kind of a surprising finding, and it's a very robust one. Um, children at three years old will say the blue box, and you can't get it out of their head that it's going to be the, uh, the, 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 the blue box. By the time they're four to five years old, children have got it. So um, you'll be pleased to hear that you did at least as well as the four to five year olds. But that is a big hurdle. So what is going on there? Why is it that children can't get it? That, um, I mean, it seems like the most obvious thing in the world, right? So how could you, what could be going on for children when they're at a level where they understand this perfectly well, but they don't have the concept that Maxi might have a false belief about where the ball is, right? They just don't have the idea of false belief. It's been tested in, from many, many different directions, this, this finding. Um, for example, also about children's um, knowledge of their own beliefs. Uh, one classic test, you show a children um, a candy box, um, and you say, what's inside the box? And the child says, candy. Um, then you open the box, and you show the child it's full of pencils. And the children will be really surprised by this, right? You pitch it right. Um, someone said to me, their jaws literally drop when they see the pencils. That was the last thing they expected. And then you ask them a couple of minutes later, what did you think was in the box when I first showed you it? And they say, pencils, right? They don't have the idea that they themselves could ever have had a false belief. So what seems to be going on is that there's an early concept of belief um, that is not really capable of being false. Belief at this early stage is a relation between the person and a bit of the world. So if you're asking, what's the bit of the world that is going to guide Maxi in finding and in looking in, uh, looking for for the ball. The only ball involving bit of the world is the blue box. So the three year old is going to say, "Well, Maxi, if he's got any knowledge at any beliefs at all about where the ball is, they must be those that involve the place the ball actually is. Therefore, he's going to look there. Um, something like that. That." There isn't the notion of belief as something that's capable of being false. Belief is a relation between the um, person and a fact out there. So what's going on seems to be like, it, it seems to be so, some ways parallel to um, development of the concept of electron, that there's an early stage in which scientists are thinking about electrons, and they have hypotheses as to what kind of uh, experimental findings they're going to get using this model of the electron. And then the findings come out wrong. They don't get the findings they predict. So they go back and they say, we need to think about electrons completely differently. Or we need to introduce the concept of another kind of particle as well. You, it's theory formation here, that you're getting from one level of theory to another. So what happens later? is that what happens in the transition from three-year-old to five-year-old is that um, at this early stage, the child has got all these predictions using this primitive concept of belief as a relation to an external fact. And you can see that what's going to go wrong here, um, the child's predictions are all going to come out wrong, right? Because does Maxie look in the blue box? No, Maxi looks in the red box. And the child, the three-year-old, has absolutely no way of explaining why Maxi is looking in the red box. Yeah? So the child is saying, well, I need some new concept here. I need some new construct to explain why Maxi is looking in the red box. Yeah? Um, so in the experiment, did the three-year-olds overwhelmingly pick the blue box, or did they just pick either one sort of without ambiguity? They pick the blue box. They don't pick the red box. 
Well, because they're taking it that um, the only cognitive relation has, Maxi has a view as to where the ball is. They know the ball is in the blue box. Oh. Right? Oh, yeah, remember, right you were told. Right. Uh, yeah. okay. This is what I say, follow me like a leopard, right? That was, you saw Dad do that, right? Unlike Maxi, yeah. So you knew the ball was in the blue box. I mean, if you're the child in the experiment, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's why you're making that prediction. He's going to look in there. Um, but all the predictions are coming out wrong in what the child is doing at three years old. So the child needs a new theoretical construct. The concept of a belief as an attitude to a proposition that might be true or false. So what the child develops is the idea that there's that proposition, the ball is in the red box, and the child can believe that. I mean, Maxi can be believing that, whether or not it's true or false. Is that OK so far? Let me just, the, 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 the developmental psychology through the 1990s basically consisted, well, someone once said to me is um, the subject divides into those that are working on false belief and those that are not working on false belief with those that are working in false belief being vastly outnumbering everyone else. Um, uh, so let me just go over that idea of an attitude to a proposition, because Churchland talks such a lot about this. What's a proposition, class? A proposition is something that can be capable of being true or false. So the bag is on the table. Is that a proposition? Help. Is that a proposition? OK, very good. OK. <laughs> So if you've got a, a proposition, something that's capable of being true or false, the kind of thing that's expressed by a sentence, you might say a thought, something like that. Um, so for example, if you take, um, here are two thoughts, here are two people thinking. Jim thinks that the University of California was founded in 1873. Sally thinks that the University of California was founded in 1868. So are there propositions that Jim and Sally have attitudes to? Yes, there they are, right? The University of California was founded in 1873. The University of California was founded in 1868. So these are two different propositions, but Jim has the same attitude to his proposition that Sally has to hers, right? Jim believes that, Sally believes that. These are attitudes to propositions, yeah? So when you're thinking about the psychology of a person, a lot of what's going on is you have these attitudes to various propositions that the person has. You can think that practically anything. Yep. Uh, what other attitudes are there to propositions than thinks there's hopes? You can hope that the University of California was founded in 1868. You can fear that the University of California was founded in 1868. Anything else? Other attitudes to propositions? Believes, yes. Want that, yes. You can want that, the University of California have been, yeah. Is that it? Is that all the proper? Hey, come on, <laughs> there are plenty more propositional attitudes. Yeah, I'm angry that the University of California was founded in 1868, sure. Or if you take it a bit more, um, let's take something a bit more effectively possible, like, he is here. I am angry that he is here. I wish that he were here. Would that he were here. I long that he be here. Yeah? I dread that he be here. Yes? Can you say, I remember? Very good. Yeah, I remember that he was here. Yeah. I predict that he'll be here. I expect that he'll be here. Come on, guys. <laughs> you can do this. I see. Very good. I see that he is here. Yeah, perfect. Love. I love that he is here. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, those are two particularly good ones. They'll, they'll have to do, I guess. We'll settle for quality over quantity. Okay, but the general idea of a propositional attitude is fairly clear. Yes? That, okay. Um, so, so far in the class, when we were talking about consciousness, a lot of the time we've been talking about qualia, things like the sensation of redness, 
or what it feels like when you have an Indian burn, or um, uh, the thrill of being in a fight, the ecstasy of a drunken brawl at, at midnight. Um, and these are different to propositional attitudes, right? Um, they, they, they don't have that same kind of structure. Just having an itch or a pang doesn't have the same kind of structure. Now, the thing is, the intriguing thing about propositional attitudes is that when you look at those propositions, there are logical relations between propositions. And the attitudes cause one another in a way that mirrors the way that the propositions logically imply one another. OK. OK, this is a little bit subtle. Come, come, come with me down this track. Um, suppose that someone believes that either P or Q, right? Either he's here or he's in the cafe. Suppose he believes that he's not here. That proposition, um, either he's here or he's in the cafe, and he's not here. Do those propositions logically imply anything? Yes, what do they imply? He's in the cafe. Yes, OK. Yeah, X has that belief. I mean, how X came by that belief is a, 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 another part of the story, right? Um, God told X. Right. OK. okay. <laughs> it's my story, right? Um, so he believes that he's either in the here or in the cafe. He believes that he's not here. So these logically imply that he's in the cafe, right? So if X has these two beliefs, what will they cause X to believe? that he's in the cafe. Yeah? So there are, there are the, if you just look at the propositions, there are logical connections between them. And then when you pan back and look at the propositional attitudes, there are causal connections between them. And the causal connections between the attitudes mirror the logical connections among the propositions. Yeah? If the subject's at all rational, if you believe two things that logically imply a third thing, then if you're rational and if you care, you'll believe that third thing. That will cause you to believe the third thing. Yep. Can you also say that like, a Q is something that will cause anyone to be afraid of X, and X is to be afraid of X? If P is something that will cause anyone to be afraid of it, uh, that doesn't quite make sense. P is a proposition, remember, that the tiger is on the prowl, for well, example. Um, if P is a thing that anyone would be afraid of, but remember, P is a proposition. Yeah? You can be frightened that the tiger is on the prowl because you're frightened of the tiger. But the tiger is a thing out there with foreign claws. Yeah? Do propositions have foreign claws? No. So what you're frightened of has foreign claws. Therefore, it's not a proposition. This is a little bit subtle. Right? You're frightened that the tiger is on the prowl. But what you're frightened of is not the proposition. What you're frightened of is the thing, the tiger. Yeah. Um, so the, the, you write that there is causation here, that, that the, the, the object might cause you to be afraid. But that's different to this kind of pure structure here, which is that the attitudes are causing one another. Your belief, say I'm afraid that the tiger is on the prowl, um, and I believe that the tiger is on the prowl. Uh, uh, I am afraid whenever the tiger is on the prowl, and I believe that the tiger is on the prowl. Those two attitudes might cause me to have a third attitude, namely fear that the tiger is on the prowl. Yep, yep. Um, I, just to like clarify, you said logical relations between propositions yes. create the causal connections with the attitude. That's right. Okay, good, yeah. So um, that's to say, I mean, what I said was um, when you're moving from believing that Max has got to be looking in the blue box to having the idea that Max has got beliefs that might be false, what you're doing is you're working your way into this theory where there are the way that the causal structure of a person goes mirrors the way um, uh, the logical relations among the propositions go. 
So you've got a stack of propositions that imply a conclusion. Then anyone who's rational and cares, uh, who believes all those propositions, will believe the conclusion. Yeah? That's all right? So this is a theory. This is a theory in the sense that the, the, uh, the notion of an electron um, is part of a theory. <coughs> you can think of the way the propositions are working here or as analogous to the way that numbers work in physics. I mean, suppose you've got um, a gas, suppose you've got a, a, a right in front of you gas in a container. Then you've got here a physical object, the gas in this container, and it's got various aspects. Right, it's got pressure, temperature, volume, um, mass. Um, so the way you describe the object, the way you describe the uh, pressure, temperature, and mass, and all that, is by giving numbers to them. Yes? Every individual step here should be perfectly obvious, but we are heading inexorably to the conclusion that the mind does not exist. So bear that in mind, <laughs> right? Um, so what's going on with a gas is that you know the laws governing the gas. So then when you give numbers to all these different aspects of the gas, you know how the gas is going to behave. So um, there are laws governing physical objects stated in terms of the relations between these numbers. So um, I'm told that as you've got a fixed mass of gas, I put it fixed, number of molecules of the gas, if the gas pressure is P and the volume is V and the temperature is T, then the temperature is the volume times the pressure. Right? OK. Thank you. I hope that's right. Um, OK. Uh, so that tells you, once you know the numbers for the temperature and volume of the gas, now you know how the gas is going to behave because you know these general laws. Um, so the way it works with people Suppose that you have been sitting next to the same person all semester, um, but you don't know much about them. You want to find out about them the way you might try to find out about a gas in a container in front of you. If there's a gas in a container in front of you, you give numbers to all the relevant magnitudes. Um, with people, I mean, you can give numbers to various of their magnitudes, their size and weight and so on, but that doesn't tell you about their mind. What you want to know, if you want to know about this person as a person, is there are these different aspects of them. Just as with a gas, there is um, pressure and temperature and mass. With a person, there are these different attitudes, hopes, fears, beliefs, memories. And do you give numbers to them? No. What do you do? Suppose you say, what do you hope of the person next to you? What are your hopes? Well, the kind of thing you would get if you ask, well, what do you hope? Is a whole bunch of stuff like, I hope I get a good grade. I hope my mother recovers. I hope I get a vacation in Rome. I get elected to Congress. I pay my debts. This cough isn't TB. There's world peace, right? That's how you calibrate a person. You give proposition. You don't give numbers here. You give propositions for the attitude. Hope that. You see what I mean? You get a big, long list of what they hope. You get a big, long list of, let's say, what they believe. You get a big, long list of propositions that they fear are true or what they love are true. Um, once you've done that, then you know how they're going to behave because you know the analog of the gas law, which is that the way that people behave will mirror the logical relations among the propositions. You measure people psychologically using propositions in the same way you measure physical objects using numbers. That's what's going on when we're talking about the mind. You've got a kind of abacus here, a way of explaining and predicting the behavior of people. Just as in physics, you've got a way of explaining and predicting the behavior of a gas using numbers. You've got the way of um, explaining and predicting the behavior of people using propositions. OK, that's what you did between 3 and 5. You catapulted yourself into using this theory that now seems so simple. And um, you, you just take it for granted. You don't even think about it. It's, well, I hope that when I'm articulating this, 
it seems like I'm laboring something perfectly obvious because I'm suggesting is something you've been taking it for granted in your own thinking since you were five. When you were three, it was a big struggle to get to that. But now working with this theory is a simple, familiar fact of everyday life. So there are laws governing people, just as there are laws governing gases, connecting pressure, temperature, and volume. There are laws governing people that are stated in terms of the propositions towards which the people have attitudes. So just a simple example of a law like that. Um, suppose that um, you've got two propositions, P and Q, and X believes either P or Q, and that X believes that not P, then what will that cause to happen? It will believe in Q. Yes, it won't cause Q itself to be so. Yes. Just watch it, that's all. But, right, OK. Um, so um, for any person, right, and any propositions P and Q, suppose that you want to annoy the neighbors and you believe that um, banging on the wall will annoy your neighbors, right? I mean, just to take, <laughs> just to take an example or, or, or random, um, then you'll want to bring it about that you bang the wall. Yes? Sorry? Generally. Yeah, I mean, if you want to annoy the neighbors. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want to keep peace with the neighbors and you believe that um, turning down the volume will bring about peace with the neighbors, then you will want to turn down the volume. Yeah, make a more um, respectable example. Yeah. Right, very good. These, th th this is a little bit simple, yeah. Um, so the, you, you, you would really need some clause here like, and you don't have any other relevant beliefs or desires, yeah. Or some way of looking, panning back and looking at the big picture. So it's not going to be trivial to properly articulate all this. The, 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 that's just right and important, what you say. Um, but that we work with generalization is like this the whole time. I mean, that's how ordinary life is possible. Right? And if you just, um, as we were talking right now, I have a whole bunch of assumptions about what you believe and want. You have assumptions about what I believe and want. Um, that's how you predict what people are going to do. If you're driving, you just assume that, well, if he's signaling left, that means he wants to turn left, and that means he's going to do this. Yeah? You're assuming that the other person is broadly rational the whole time. So what's going on here is that when you were five years old, you worked your way into this theory. From then until now, you've just got better and better at working with this theory. That's what folk psychology is. It's a theory about the causes of behavior. And since it's a theory about the causes of behavior, it could be completely wrong. Um, if we've reached this point, if that seems plain enough so far, then you are already in a position where it makes perfect sense to suggest you might not be thinking, you might not be conscious. That might not be the right way to think. OK? Yes? What exactly is folk psychology? Folk psychology is working with, pro uh, at this point, I can just talk about propositional attitudes, and you know what I mean? Yeah. Believing, desiring, hoping, feeling. Yeah. Um, folk psychology for present purposes is working with all this talk about propositional attitudes in a way that explains and predicts the behavior of other people. Yeah? I mean, it's pretty good. We use it the whole time, and it, we, 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 it, 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 it does us some good. We, we do a lot better. The five-year-olds are doing a lot better in explaining and predicting than the three-year-olds are. Yeah? But what we'll come to in a moment is that there are big limitations in this. Yep, yeah. So, your question? Oh, no, it's gone. Okay, it's gone away. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, plain enough. Okay, well, here's an analog for um, the way Churchland is thinking about um, our ordinary talk about the mind. <coughs> I mean, after all, in our ordinary talk about physical objects, uh, when you're born, 
you have a kind of physics of the world around you. And you take it for granted that the chairs will support your weight, um, that heavier things will, um, and you know, when you throw things, um, it's a very intuitive notion. If you throw, I mean, <laughs> tempting though it is, I wouldn't actually do it. But you know, where, a, where well, if you just throw, throw something around a little bit, yeah? Why does the thing move? Why does the thing move, continue moving after it's left your hand? You might say, well, I can see well enough why it moves while I'm holding it in my hand and I move my hand. But why should it keep moving? Well, a very natural theory there is that you communicate some impetus to the object. And the impetus is what keeps the thing moving. But impetus naturally decays after a while. And then the thing stops moving. Yeah? And we talk like that the whole time anyway. Yeah. Uh, he, he, uh, we often use it as a metaphor. Um, uh, the whole civil rights movement was given impetus by this speech. You know, it was given some of this thing that kept it moving forward for a little bit, but then it naturally decayed. That was, in medieval times, the, um, uh, the main theory, uh, the main official ex <laughs> did, did you hear that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. In, in medieval times, um, the, the, the explicit physics that scholars had was a theory stated in terms of impetus. So um, when you have uh, someone like this guy in his underwear here um, whirling um, something around, then... Um, uh, why does the thing keep moving the way it does when he lets go of it? Well, it's because he gave some impetus to it. And it was thought that impetus was maybe circular, typically circular, so that if you're doing that, you'd give a circular impetus to the thing so it would keep kind of looping round. Is that theory correct or not? Yeah, it's not correct. But um, there are plenty of tests with, actually with um, college students where people are given puzzles like this and say, how will the thing move? If you had a gun with a spiral barrel and it fired bullets through the spiral barrel, how would the bullets move when they came out? Straight ahead. Straight ahead is the right answer, but you will find a surprisingly large number of college students who think, no, it kind of goes, right? Uh, it keeps whirling around. And that's a very intuitive answer. You know, it's not like you say, well, that's just some kind of madness. You're born with that kind of physics. Nature gives you some kind of starter pack of the physics of your environment. And it seems to have these notions like impetus in it. But impetus theory just has a lot of limitations. Um, if, th th there are lots of basic phenomena it can't explain. Like, um, why do the planets keep going? I mean, th Newton seems to have had some picture like, when the planets were first formed, God kind of gave them a foot <laughs> to get them going. Um, but it, an impetus theory, the impetus that the planets had to start with should keep running out. So they should need to keep getting some more nudging to keep them moving, right? But they clearly don't need any kind of pushes like that. Um, or the tides. The ti Part of what is so poignant about the tides is the way they just keep rolling in and out, relentlessly in and out. The way they did it before you were born, the way they'll be doing it after you're dead. Um, and they don't need any push to do that, right? There is not impetus that is keeping the water moving. Um, or what uh, Galileo basically did through decades of his life, measuring the movement of balls rolling down inclined planes. Impetus theory couldn't explain the details of the varying speeds at which balls get down in inclined planes. So what happened was that um, the notion of impetus got thrown out. Impetus theory got replaced by uh, in Newton's time by a more general um, theory that could explain everything that impetus theory could explain and also could explain all the phenomena that impetus theory just couldn't address at all, like the tides and so on. So what happened was that the talk about impetus just got thrown out. No physicist nowadays 
talks about impetus. That's just not part of physics. There is no such thing as impetus. There is no such thing as that thing that you communicate to the object when you throw it. Um, all there are are force, mass, acceleration, friction, things like that. So impetus not similar to inertia then? Well, it's replaced by notions like inertia. Yeah. Um, inertia is, how should I put it, it's something that everything has anyway. Impetus was something that you gave to the object. Sort of like a, an inertia, like a catalyst. Uh, these, these are analogies, right? The, the, yeah, these are, these are okay analogies, but yeah. Um, so the question is, nature gives you, evolution gives you your folk psychology. It's very important that you be wired up when you're born with some way of negotiating other people. The, I mean, the most basic thing a baby has to do is to connect with the adults around it. That's the first thing, right? Children can't make it on their own. Evolution has just got to wire them to have some way of psychologically connecting to people around them. Otherwise, the species would perish in a generation, right? It's, that's got to happen. Um, so there's a starter pack here, just as we've got a starter pack from evolution for the physics of the objects around us. We've got a starter pack um, that uses notions like belief and desire. Um, that's what, what, what we naturally use in interacting with other people. But that is something that maybe there's a lot of cultural learning in it, takes different forms in different places. But that's going to lead, just as um, folk physics leads on to scientific physics, so folk psychology should lead you on to scientific psychology. And the question is, are there limitations of folk psychology? Now, notice incidentally that when I'm talking about um, folk psychology here, I'm not just talking about your knowledge of what's going on with other people, people's minds. This applies also to your knowledge of what's going on in your own mind. In your knowledge of what you're thinking, what you're believing, and so on, you're using that starter pack of folk psychology just as much as you are using it in connection with other people. Now, are there limitations to folk psychology? I mean, is there an, are there analogs to the movement of the tides or the movement of the planets, things that folk psychology, things that our ordinary talk about in the mind just can't explain. Anything? Examples? Uh, the My body problem is a good one, yeah. Yes, sir? Irrational, Irrational behavior, excellent. Yeah, what, what kind of thing do you have in mind? Um. Okay. But, uh, 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 there, it's not that there aren't any examples, it's that there are millions of examples, <laughs> right? Okay, so certainly, because everything I said so far about folk psychology is geared to explaining everything in terms of rationality. Mm -hmm. So if you've got something that's truly irrational, then folk psychology is helpless. Um, it, it just can't explain it. Yep, yep. Um, maybe like a circumstance where you're being forced to do something you don't want to do? Uh, are you giving that as an example of irrationality? Wouldn't apply. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So, so, if you have, so, yeah, if you have something where it's not your beliefs and desires making you do it, yeah, then folk psychology is not going to explain that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You might find that folk psychology, your folk psychology, just doesn't get a grip with them. Yeah, for someone from a completely alien culture. That is possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, lying, for example. Lying? Yeah. I don't know. Lying might be highly rational. It depends on the lying. I guess, like, if you lie to someone, then you're being, like, you know, you're being good instead of trying to be. I don't know. Like, you could say, like, the joke example is, like, I'm not stoic. And then you, like, clearly are because you're. Yeah. That, uh, well, yeah. That's not always lying. Um, you, you might be perfectly sincere there. Um, but lying, lying is often, it seems to me, highly rational. When, when politicians lie, um, nobody says they're being irrational. The trouble is they're being all too rational. Uh, you know. Look, here's a list um, 
Uh, I think a uh, 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 phenomenon that church from the things. <laughs> what? What just happened? <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe that is an example of the limitations of folk psychology. I have no idea what's going on. Right. Okay. Um. Creativity. How did Darwin come up with the theory of evolution? How did um, uh, uh, J.K. Rowling come up with the Harry Potter stories? Um, how did you just have that great idea for an essay? Um, how did um, how did uh, Robert Frost come up with the poems that he did? Well, in folk psychology, there is no way of explaining these things. We just casually regard them as mysteries. We say, well, we'll never get to the bottom of that. It really is um, a fundamental problem there. Um, but that's not, I mean, we're, com we're used to regarding that as a mystery. But that doesn't mean it's OK to regard it as a mystery. It ought to be possible to explain these phenomena. Um, yeah? Association. Association. Yeah. OK, we can, we can put that as a theory of creativity. The, the trouble you will have is in giving any um, prediction. prediction, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. G giving your substance to the idea of which associations are going to be the ones that really matter so here. I could, I could say that I could predict that there's going to be great novels for great books. I mean, nobody really came before it. You could predict that, but you would be wrong. <laughs> okay. Um, why are some people smarter than others? <coughs> I mean, is it? No one has the slightest idea. Why are some people smarter than others? Is it because of the way they were brought up? Is it because they went to Berkeley? Is it was because they didn't do philosophy? Um, I mean, there isn't a sensible theory here. What goes on when people are dreaming? Why do we sleep? I mean, people have been working on this very intensively. Um, why do we sleep? And in particular, what's dreaming for? And nobody has anything very good to say about it. Um, one theory is that when you sleep, it kind of keeps you out of trouble. Um, you know, you, when it's dark, you can't see too good. So if you sleep, that kind of keeps you out of trouble. That's <laughs> not far from the state of the art. Um, yeah. Yeah. So then you ask why oh, why do we get tired? Yeah. Uh, how come sleep helps with being tired? Yeah. Um, uh, and what's dreaming? What is all that about anyway? You know, why do we dream? Um, you might try, uh, anyone could try off the top of their head something about, um, well, emotional processing, um, maybe something about cognitive reinforcement, something as vague as that. And then that's it. That's what it runs out. Why do you have the dreams you do? Nobody has any idea. Um, folk psychology just can't address these things. How come some people are good at basketball and some people are not good at basketball? I don't know. How come it's so hard to learn to ride a bike? Well, see, I found it very hard to learn to ride a bike. So how come there's so much variation? In how, what's going on when you're riding a bike anyway? From the point of view of current cognitive psychology, that is an absolute mystery. There simply isn't a good theory of how people do stuff like riding bicycles. Um, how does vision work? If you want to understand, I mean, you get a 2D pattern on the retina, and so somehow that generates the whole rich visual world that you get around you. What's going on there? Talking about people's beliefs and desires just doesn't do it. It doesn't begin to address how you get from the retina to the um, whole conscious 3D presentation of the world. Why do you get perceptual illusions like the moon seeming larger when it's at the horizon than when it's not? Why does that happen? Because of your beliefs and desires? Why is it that um, if you draw two lines the same length and you do the arrowheads like this, 
Well, you see what I mean. A picture, if you will. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I didn't do that too good. OK. Um, how come this, this line looks larger than that one? Because of what you believe and desire. Um, this is an artist's impression. This is not the real thing. Um, uh, is that because of what you believe and desire? Well, of course not. But you can't approach these questions in terms of folk psychology. For these questions, you just have to move to a scientific um, analysis. Why do we remember the things that we do? Why can you suddenly be overwhelmed by the memory of something that happened when you were 12, just as you were walking down the street? And another time, you try to remember it, and you just can't. You rack your brain. Why does memory work the way it does? Again, we can't do that in terms of folk psychology. Or to take one other interesting case, if you take how people learn concepts, how children learn concepts, um, that seems like about as central a question to how people learn as anything else. Right? Learning concepts is really basic to any kind of interesting learning. Um, is the big hurdle children have to get over. Even at university, it's the big hurdle you have to get through learning unfamiliar concepts. How do we do that? You can't do it in terms of beliefs and desires. Because talking about what beliefs and desires you, you have presupposes that you have all the concepts. It can't explain how you get new concepts. Now, just as with physics, there's a way of coming to physics that says, let's forget the stuff about impetus. Let's have a fully general theory that applies to the planets, that applies to atoms, it applies to billiard balls, it applies to the physical behavior of waves out at sea, and you do it in terms of um, force and acceleration and mass and so on. Um, there's another way to approach the explanation of human behavior which is to say, let's forget that stuff about beliefs and desires. Let's not talk about beliefs and desires at all. Let's look at cell functioning. Let's look at um, the uh, ways that assemblies of cells fire and how they excite or inhibit each other's firings. Um, then you can talk about, then you can have a, a quite general theory about the basis of behavior that will apply to every human and to everything that every human does. Because what you're talking about here when you're looking at the biological bases of behavior are things that underpin any kind of human movement or action at all. But they also don't just apply to humans. They apply to any animal. There are going to be general laws governing the ways that neurons work that are far more general than talk about belief and desire and that just won't give up when you're talking about perceptual illusions or memories or um, whatever it might be. So there is available a much more general theory than folk psychology, just as folk physics has available a, a much more general theory, namely scientific physics. So looking at it like that, what we ought to be doing is replacing talk about thinking and believing and feeling, replace that with a much more general theory that can explain everything that folk psychology can explain, but also all these other phenomena that folk psychology can't explain. So if you think of it like that, then believing, hoping, desiring, remembering, fearing, wishing, loving, longing, they will all go the same way as impetus. There is no such thing as impetus. There is no such thing as loving, fearing, wishing, hoping, any more than there is such a thing as impetus. What is going to turn out is that scientific psychology measures people. That way of measuring people, that way of calibrating people in terms of propositions uh, is just not that good a way of explaining and predicting the behavior of people. We need a much more general approach, talking about information processing in the brain that um, the subject might not be conscious of at all. I mean, let me give just one other example of the limits of folk psychology here. Um, folk psychology can't explain. We, look, we spent a while looking at schizophrenia in one class. 
Folk psychology just can't explain stuff like schizophrenia or delusions that psychiatric patients have. When we say someone is crazy, what you're doing is you're marginalizing them. But looking at it from another way, the other thing you're doing is flagging up, pointing out the limitations of your own theory of the mind. Because when you say someone is crazy, what you're saying is my theory of the mind can't engage with this person. My theory of mind can't explain or predict what's going on with this person. And I bet, and if you're saying it for someone else's benefit, if you say, well, she's just crazy, what you mean is don't even bother trying to get your theory of mind to connect with this person because it won't do it. Um, that's not something about them that is wrong. That is a limitation in your way of thinking of things. Just as with impetus, you hit limitations in your way of thinking of things. When you say someone's crazy, what you're doing is you're putting them in a box and saying, my theory of mind is not going to work for this person. So you remember we had this case of a 22-year-old woman who um, thought that both thoughts and feelings emanating from her mother's unconscious were being communicated to her via raindrops that fell on her air conditioner. So when the raindrops hit the air conditioner, they went crack, and the thoughts and feelings would be inserted into her mind. Can you explain that in terms of the beliefs and desires of this patient? I mean, it just keeps, kind of seems obvious. You might try to cook up something Freudian, but it seems obvious right at the start that this is not going to work. So when Descartes says the certainty with which you know of your own existence is greater than the certainty with which you could know of the existence of any physical thing, when Descartes says, at last I have discovered it, thought, this alone is inseparable from me. We did this in the very first lecture of this class, and then it seems like this is just a basic certainty. Descartes was surely right about that. Everything else might be an illusion, um, but surely you know about your own thinking, right? Can you put your hand up if it still seems to you that Descartes was right about that? You're certain about your own thinking, even if everything else is an illusion. Yeah? OK. What I'm suggesting is that's really a big mistake. Um, you are not certain of your own thinking. When you say you're certain of your own thinking, what you're doing is you're just working within folk psychology. Um, Descartes is just working within folk psychology the same way you might work with an impetus theory. And if someone says to me, um, you, objects don't have impetus. Physics has thrown out that notion of impetus. You could say, but look, impetus, right? Impetus. Does that, if I do that, does that demonstrate that things have impetus? I just gave this impetus. It doesn't at all. All that's going on here is, I'm taking the notion of impetus for granted and working within impetus theory. And when I work within impetus theory, it seems so obvious. Sure, there you go, that's impetus at work. And similarly, if I take the notion of thinking for granted and use that and say, look, here it is, here's thinking going on, that's just like tossing the duster and saying, there's impetus for you. You're saying, look, here's thinking. What could be more certain than that? But th that just underestimates the challenge. The challenge to talking about impetus is not maybe you only think this object has impetus, but it doesn't really, and other things have impetus. The challenge is the radical one, that the very idea of impetus has to go out of the window and be replaced by talk about force, acceleration, and mass. And the challenge to the idea of thinking is not well, maybe you saw thinking, maybe you thought you got thinking here, but well, it wasn't really what you'd call thinking. Um, that's not the challenge. The challenge is the whole idea of thinking has to go out of the window and be replaced by talk about what is going on with the biology of the brain. Yep. Um, I might have this wrong, but it seems like to me what you said about impetus, like with the analogy, that 
the reason we're throwing emphasis out as a theory is because even though like it, it covers a certain amount of things, we've seen all these things that it can't. It can't cope with for, exactly. And that's why we have to throw it out. Exactly. But to me, that sounds like it doesn't. It's not that there's anything within the, what the emphasis theory covers that is necessarily wrong. It's just that there's stuff outside of it that we haven't accounted for. So right. Because like. That doesn't seem like a logical enough reason to throw out necessarily propositional atti attitude psychology. It just means that there's more stuff we should add to what we believe. Yeah. So it, it doesn't necessarily say that anything that we've learned through propositional attitude psychology is wrong. Mm -hmm. It just means that there might be additional truth. Okay, that's an important point. Um, um, the, 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 the remaining question is going to be, how does impetus relate to the concepts of scientific physics, yeah? So suppose we say the more general notion is that um, we talk about force and acceleration and mass and so on, yeah? And uh, then we say, but couldn't impetus be a local part of the picture? You, you see what I mean? Yeah, because it works fine within the restricted domain, yeah? The question is going to be, does impetus map onto any of these concepts? like force and acceleration and mass, that we know of what the underlying reality is. Yeah? And the reason impetus gets thrown out is it doesn't actually have any tidy map onto these under, uh, underlying notions. Yeah? So if it did, then you could say, yeah, impetus is just a special case. Yeah? Um, but that's not what happens. That's why the notion gets tossed. Similarly, you could say, the belief desire bit just works within a certain limited domain. Let's hang on to it for that. But we know what the general theory looks like. It has to do with stuff about the biology of the brain. And what we're learning is that, I mean, in a way, this is something we've been psyching up for the whole term, is that there is no tidy map from these talk, talk about belief or desire onto anything put in terms of brain biology. I guess Yeah. I, I guess I thought that the reason we were throwing it out was like, for all we know, there's some more all-encompassing viewpoint that tells us that there's something more to this thinking. And that seems to me like a weird uh, reason to throw out something that we believe is good. Because there's nothing that di like directly proves what he said is false. All it's done is just said that there might be something that tells us more. Yeah. Okay, that's an important possibility and I, 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 I don't want to try and close that off right now. Okay. Yeah, one. I hear the discussion say that they thought this was an introduction to social psychology. Uh-huh. Because I think he talked a lot more than just the anxiety and that sort of thing. Everything that you think at all, that's not what that not that I'm not that I'm not That's right, that's right. But these are all folk psychological notions. And if the challenge is folk psychology is wrong from start to finish that is a bad set of concepts to be using, um, then he's really helpless against that challenge, it seems to me. You, you, you can't um, meet that challenge just by saying, well, it seems to me very certain that I'm thinking, any more than you can s meet the challenge to the impetus theory by saying, but yeah, that's, this is impetus. Well, you, you, surely you'd call that impetus. Yeah. Well, he... I think, what he's saying, I think he means prop something propositional. I think uh, is involves thoughts, yeah, which just are propositions. Uh, yep. Right. Yes. That's right. But I, th I think that's exactly how Churchland wants to think about it. That you could think of impetus as a working concept for daily life. It's just that when you look at, when you step back and look at what's literally objectively true, then you're not going to talk in those terms. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, so talking about beliefs and desires, good working concept, helps us get around 
but it actually doesn't literally reflect anything that's really going on. Um, sorry? Yes. We don't want to take it too. You don't want to take it too seriously. L uh, last one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, okay. In this example, um, well, that's not the correct way to frame something. That seems to what happens when you when you throw something, it still has something, yes. but it's forcing it to come in different ways and different amounts. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, right? <laughs> that no, that is not correct. <laughs> there, there is nothing that is forcing it to keep moving. Yeah, Right. Well, gravity and inertia are there, all right, but they they are different concepts to impetus. But, but, they, but it's still happening. Nothing is. As in, like, as in, we could say, we say that the ball. We could we can give a we can give a statement that says when I throw the ball, it'll keep moving in one way or the other. It'll move in a straight line. Yes. Right. Yeah. In the same way, there's something going on in my head all the time. Right. I Okay, that's fine. You, what you're doing there is you're saying I could take this talk of impetus and think of it just as a redescription of what everybody agrees is actually happening. I'm not telling you about the causes of things when I talk about impetus. You could try defending folk psychology like that. It's just a redescription of what's actually going on. Um, it doesn't describe the causes of what actually happens. Um, for that, you need to talk about brain biology. It's really game over for our ordinary talk about the mind, though, because if you remember going back to when we were discussing behaviorism, it's very important to our ordinary talk about the mind that we think about our motivations, our hopes, our fears, as being what make us do the things that we do. It's not just a roundabout way of re-describing what we actually do. It's supposed to be giving you insight into the causes, the springs of our behavior. Is it quick? Um, it was just like sort of like endorsing what she said. Like, if if impetus is like the force or energy with which a body moves, then yeah. all we're doing really is saying that's wrong because we can qualify what force is, what body is, and what moves is. Like, you're just taking the definition we already have <laughs> and qualifying it. You're not like like refuting it in a sense of saying it. But it's not wrong. It's not inaccurate. It's not, it's not inaccurate if you say it's not about causes. Yeah? If you say it's not about causes and try to describe it, as, as try to reinterpret it the way the behaviorists did, uh, just talk about what behavior is actually going on. But where it's going wrong is if you take it to be giving you any insight into the clockwork of the human being, into what makes people act the way they do. That's what it's been thrown out. Yeah? Um, but that's really important. You really lost everything that we care about with the mind. If you say, love isn't what makes people do the stuff they do. Love is just a way of re-describing the fact that sometimes they act in those ways. Yeah. Um, I just want that the, the, if you think how, um, how do we go next if this is right, if church lines are right, um, Paul and Pat Churchland uh, uh, started developing this idea that ordinary talk about the mind should just be eliminated a long time ago, 30, 40 years, is something like that. Um, they have been living with this idea for a very long time. And at first, to most of us, it seems you just couldn't get by without talking about what people want, what people hope for and so on. But there was a kind of interesting New Yorker um, um, uh, interview with the Churchlands um, a couple of years ago where uh, they quoted um, this uh, for, uh, from the course of the interview. Paul and Pat, realizing that the revolutionary neuroscience they dream of, the neuroscience that is going to replace talk about the mind, Realizing that this is still in its infancy, they are nonetheless already preparing themselves for this future, making the appropriate adjustments in their everyday conversation. One afternoon recently, Paul says, he was at home making dinner 
when Pat burst in the door, having come straight from a frustrating faculty meeting. She said, Paul, don't speak to me. My serotonin levels have hit bottom. My brain is awash in glucocorticoids. My blood vessels are full of adrenaline, and if it weren't for my endogenous opiates, I'd have driven the car into a tree on my, uh, on my way home. My dopamine levels need lifting. Pour me a Chardonnay. I'll be down in a minute. Okay, so there you go. You learn to talk like that. Um, and uh, you can eliminate talk about the mind. I was actually talking to a student from um, Shanghai who told me that the last time he'd gone home, he found that his friends were actually talking like this. Um, um, that naturally, that um, I think that's not an uncommon phenomenon, that if you have the neuroscientific sophistication to talk like that, then it can seem like a, just a much more precise and exact way of describing what is going on with you and other people than um, uh, talking about the mind. Paul and Pat have noticed that it's not just they who talk this way, their students now speak of psychopharmacology as comfortably as of food. So, with that glimpse of the future, yeah. Uh, like Central state materialism said beliefs and desires exist, all right. It's just that all they are are brain states. This theory says beliefs and desires don't exist. All that are our brain states. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You may be right, but the, on the other hand, Churchland's point is uh, you may be wrong. You cannot draw bounds around what the science will do in that way. So, sorry, we've got to be quick. Um, yep. Last one. I channel different people at different times. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm not claiming consistency for absolutely everything I say throughout this class. OK, on that note, we have to stop. Um, d d d d try and bring your, if you have comments, please try and bring them to the front. <laughs>